judgment a mistake, or whether we should call it irrational expectations, or whether we just need to think a little bit harder about what these concepts really mean. It is certainly going to cause people to make errors that could be costly, right? I will, I will take over this company. I will invade this country, right? I mean, I think it's, it's arguably, I think it's inarguable <laughs> that Hitler's decision to invade Russia was A, driven by overconfidence. He wasn't manically elated by his successes in Western Europe. Um, and B, that it had the consequences for the people of Germany, not much less the people of Russia, um, probably, probably the greatest single source of suffering in all of human history. So, you know, big mistakes could be Hitler was doing perfectly rational phasing updating on his abilities as a military commander, right? Could have panned out really well for the German people. Turns out it didn't. So the stakes are high, and we don't really know quite what to say about this yet. Now, let me just make sure that everyone is really, really clear that I personally do not hold a belief that Adolf Hitler was perfectly rational. Okay? I think he was actually mentally ill. Okay, um, so let me just say a few summarizing remarks about probability inference. Okay, obviously, uh, the assumption of rational expectations fails systematically in lots of situations and sometimes big and economically important ways. Okay? And in particular, it's important to note that the errors can be systematic. It's all very well if sometimes people are a little high, a little low. That just means that they're inaccurate. But if they're systematically always low or systematically always high in their inference, then we have a systematic error that creates a bias, and that's, gonna, that's potentially going to money things up economically. Um, we may be able to make some progress understanding uh, these kinds of errors on the basis of some psychological arguments, like people just simply prefer to use shortcuts, cognitive shortcuts, heuristics, which are often kind of close enough, but sometimes cause big problems. Or that, in fact, we're actually hardwired to make certain kinds of mistakes because they're evolutionarily beneficial to us, or were, back when evolution was actually happening to human beings. Um, but it's also possible, or it seems like we have some evidence, that part of the problem is that people simply don't do the math we expect them to do in our models. Okay? That it isn't some psychological weirdness or some evolutionary thing, but that even in situations when people manifestly should do math, like a doctor interpreting a test, right, or should at least know qualitatively what kind of math they ought to be doing, uh, they, they don't. Okay? In terms of capturing this with models, which is kind of our primary, for me, I, I, the way I understand psychology and economics is that the primary goal uh, should be to, to build mathematical models of these things so that we can actually, inc actually incorporate insights from psychology into uh, neoclassical, mathematically formalistic economics um, and not just get marginalized. Um, and it's, it's a little unclear uh, how we're doing here. So in some cases, modeling can help us to see how two things that seem to be contradictory or unrelated might actually be quite closely related. Right? So we explained the gambler's fallacy and the hot hand fallacy using the same model. Okay, we, just used, we just explained overplacement and underplacement with the same model. Okay? So mathematical modeling has, I think, shed some very useful insights into what might be going on with mistakes in probability inference or patterns in probability inference. Um, but it's clear that we've been less successful in some of the other domains we've looked at so far in terms of actually hitting the nail on the head with our models. Okay? And so the model of base rate neglect, I would say, you know, whether that's the right model or not is, uh, is, is very unclear, and it's very hard to tease these things apart. Um, you could, my guess is that you could just as easily explain this pattern of overplacement and underplacement with a totally different mathematical model that would be non-rational, that would not involve rational application of Bayes' rule, and I think it would be very difficult in a lot of cases to tease apart which model is actually correct. Um, and then finally, this thing that I've just been commenting on about the fact that here we can actually see an example of, and it's not the only example in the world, but uh, um, a really cogent example of where um, you can get irrationality using what we thought was a perfectly rational model. Okay, so that's about that. Does anybody want to, any party shots before we say goodbye to probability inference? Which over the last year's slides. Okay, as I promised at the beginning of the lecture, I'm going to sort of uh, motivate social preferences by stepping back a little bit into game theory. Um, so far, we've been talking uh, pretty much exclusively about individual decision making, right? Individuals making decisions in which the outcomes of their decisions may upon, depend upon exogenous parameters of their decision making environment, like the probability of this or the price of that, but don't actually depend upon what other people do and don't depend upon what other people get, right? Now we're going we're to step out into the realm of strategic interdependence, okay? My outcomes, each person's outcomes, and or what actions are optimal to take depend upon what others do. Okay? So in a strategic setting, uh, I may not necessarily have uh, you know, a simple utility maximizing choice to make unless I know something about what you're likely to do either in response to what I do or you know, sort of like meanwhile in another part of the forest, somebody else is doing this, it affects me, I need to know something about what they're doing before I know what's optimal for me. Okay? Um, so, sorry, there's, there's way too much animation in these slides, I apologize for that. There's also an enormous number of typos. Um, okay. So there's two key things. Right? I've talked about preferences and beliefs as being sort of the things like preferences is how do you rank things, beliefs is what do you think the things are that you're ranking. Right? So if you're going to take this, if you're going to get an HIV, if you're deciding whether or not to get an HIV test, your preferences might be how do you feel about HIV, how do you feel about uncertainty, and your beliefs are what do you think is the likelihood that you're going to get a positive result on a test uh, versus a negative result, etc. Okay? So in multi-individual situations, in situations that involve some kind of strategic interdependence, we're going to want to know how people feel, what their preferences are, over the outcomes of others. Okay? So the most simple case of this is altruism. Do I like, it? You know, do I like helping other people out? But this gets more complicated than simple altruism. So we need to know that. If we're in a strategic setting, think about game theory, right? Think about like a basic prisoner's dilemma. The, 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 reason, the, the reason the prisoner's dilemma works out the way it does, or one of the reasons it's so simple, is because each of the individuals is completely self-centered and doesn't care about the outcome of the other, right? So if you, you could probably, and I haven't, I haven't seen this or done it, but you could probably tweak the prisoner's dilemma and, give, and allow people to care. Like if, it was, if the prisoner's dilemma wasn't just two randomly drawn bandits who happened to get caught red-handed doing something mean together, but it was like a husband and wife team, right? Almost a year ago to the day, I was, I was um, mugged at gunpoint down by Lake Merritt by a couple. It was really, it was embarrassing, you know? I was walking along the lakeshore with my date about 9.30 on Tuesday, and we thought, this is actually, if you ever decide to be a, a mugger, this is the way to do it. It was a really clever trick. We're going, you know, we're walking around the lake, which most people in the know would say, you probably shouldn't walk around the lake after dark, even on Tuesday night. But we thought, this, this seems safe, because look, there's another couple walking around the lake. I'm not joking. There's another couple, there's just these young folks, they just, you know, arm in arm, walking around the lake about 20 paces ahead of us. And as soon as we got behind this little low rise near, uh, near, the, near uh, Fairland, um, uh, they just turned around and it. It was embarrassing. <laughs> I was also enraging, you know, I lost my jacket, but, um. 
Anyway, the point is, if those two people, and I don't actually know if they were a couple or not, they may have just been partners in crime, right? But suppose that they're, that they're very intimate with one another and really love one another, then you might see a different outcome in the prisoner's dilemma, and they might, might actually not defect in the prisoner's dilemma. They might not rat each other out. So to understand game theory, we need to know something about social preferences. And then the other thing that we have to know if we're doing game theory is we have to know what people's beliefs are about, uh, about what others will do and how they respond to what others will do. Um, and this is, you know, I don't know if you, I'm assuming everybody here has seen at least a little bit of game theory. I don't know about you, but I look at game theory and I think to myself, that is not how I think, <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes, okay, in the prisoner's dilemma, fine. If it was someone I didn't care about, maybe it is how I think. Okay, this is, this is a no-brainer. I don't care about the guy I just got you know, busted with. I can see which side my bread is buttered on. I'm going to defect. Um, but in a lot of situations of game theory, you're just like, I see how you came up with this so-called equilibrium solution, but that's not how people think at all. And so it doesn't make sense. And what we're going to look at is that a lot of times we have to make very, very strong assumptions about people's beliefs, about what other people are going to do, and about what other people's beliefs are, about what they're going to do, and vice versa, all of which is going to bring us into the domain of bounded rationality, right? Do people actually think that way or that hard? Okay. All right. Classical game theory typically makes the following assumptions. That people have preferences over only their own outcomes, that they are self-interested, or selfish, if you want, and that players are perfectly able to predict what others will do and best respond to those predictions, which, again, doesn't mean that they will know exactly what the person's going to do, but that they will know exactly the distribution of probabilities over the person's possible actions, right? So that if you're walking around the lake and you see another couple, that you perfectly predict the probability that they're actually mudders, and the probability, if you go and walk behind this little low hill, that they will turn around and mug you, given what their best guess is as to whether or not you're carrying a gun, right? That would be game theory in Texas. Never have I so much wished I had been carrying a gun. Okay. So because, we're, so because we're building on concepts of game theory, we're just going to review it. But also because I just want to sort of have you see where these things come up just in a, in a real simple couple of examples. Okay. So a game consists of the following components, right? There's a set of players who are the participants in the game who usually are denoted by numbers 1 through N. And most of the time, we're going to do two-player games so that we can show outcomes in a two-by-two two matrix, which you will recognize, uh, I hope. So these could be the players in a chess game, two nations in a political conflict, or anything else. And, it could be, and as I'm sure you're aware, a game could have many more than two players, right? So World War II had dozens of players. Um, so, by the way, political scientists use game theory a lot to explain things like why people go to war and why people do the, the kinds of things they do. In fact, that is where game theory was initially derived. Um, was uh, initially derived? No. It's where game theory really started to take off. Was during the Cold War, um, this, the State Department and the Defense Department needed better sort of theories about how to predict um, what, what the Soviets would do in response to, to U.S. policy choices. Um, and where it really got hot and heavy was around um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was a real sort of standoff um, where the world was probably close to, to being completely destroyed as ever in history. Um, and the and, uh, folks at the Rand Corporation, which is a big, you know, like, big black box with no windows down in uh, Southern California, which where people do a, a lot of heavy, heavy contracting for, uh, for the military, um, they, started, they started looking into how can we use game theory to understand this relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. They came up with some very interesting things. Um, so if I use war examples, it's not just because I'm obsessed with war. Okay, so you've got the players. The players have strategies. Okay, now a strategy is made up of different actions because there could be multiple rounds in a game, and you might have different actions at different stages of the game. And a strategy is a description of all the actions that you take, right? And so there's, in many games, there are multiple different strategies you could choose, different courses of action. And so we will let player I's strategy be SI, and then we have this vector of strategies for all players, right? For all n players, each one of them could be. And there might, so there's many of these vectors, bold S vectors, a possible strategy. Uh, we usually think of this as a strategy profile. Okay, and then one thing that's going to be particularly important is the vector of all strategies except for I, right? Is usually denoted S negative I. So it's this vector that includes all of the other players except for player I, who's left out. And so when we think about equilibrium as best response, right? If you remember learning about Nash equilibrium, what's the best response to somebody else's strategy? That's basically saying, what is the optimal SI given this vector S minus I? Right? What's my best response to the strategies of everybody else except me? Okay? Um, and, then, and then my utility function, if I'm player I, is going to be a function of what I do in the game and what everybody else does in the game. Right? Because there's going to be payoffs to all different players based on what everybody does. And then I'm going to have some utility function over those payoffs. Okay? So strategic interdependence means that player I's payoff depends upon what other people do. Okay? And for that, we need to make big assumptions about what people believe and about unbounded rationality and all kinds of other stuff in order to figure out what the equilibrium will be. But in addition, what we're going to do is we're going to say, not only are we dealing with strategic independence where my payoffs depend upon what you do, but also that my utility, whether or not I like a certain outcome, may also depend upon what you get, not just what you do. Okay? So if the thing that maximizes my payoff happens to leave you in, you know, in the ditch, I might not like that okay? if I'm altruistic. Or if you just hose me in the last round and the thing, that makes me, the thing that makes me best off makes you best off too, and the thing that makes me slightly less well off leaves you in the ditch, then I might very well do that if I have a desire to punish you because you hosed me in the last round. Right? So we're going to look at all that. And then there's a question of information. The other, this is all still just what defines a game. And part of the definition of a game will be what we assume each player knows about the game. Now, that's a little bit different from what we assume they believe based on some sort of Bayesian inference about probabilities or something like that. It's just what, what are we going to assume they know? They know whether the other person is nice or nasty. They know the distribution of nice and nasty types that the person might be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And then there are these different solution concepts. And most of game theory is this endless proliferation of more and more detailed solution concepts to try to come up with equilibrium solutions that seem at all realistic. So the most basic solution concept in game theory, yes. OK, so what's going on is that you have some, right, this is like you can think of this UI as like an instantaneous utility function. And it's going to determine, it's going to capture your preferences. Oh, so we could, ultimately, that utility function is going to be defined on payoffs. What you really like is what you really have preferences over is not necessarily what people do, but what, what the outcomes are as a result. Now, we're going to see situations where that's not true. Right? If someone hoses you and you want to punish them, that may not be a bad outcome. It may actually be that you have preferences over their actions. I would prefer you act in a nice way. Right? And I might want to punish you because I saw you hose somebody else. So that really has nothing to do with payoffs anymore. It's really just about I have preferences over your actions. I want you to be a nice person. Okay? But by and large, what we think, or at least the starting point for game theory and behavioral game theory, is that what you really care about is payoffs, maybe to other people as well as to yourself, but those payoffs are going to be determined by your strategy and their strategy. 
So as long as we know with certainty what the payoffs will be, given any set of strategies, there's like a one-to-one -one map of mapping from strategy profiles to payoffs in, in most games. And we're going to let you have preferences over. So, so will, in other words, unless we, unless we include preferences over people being nice versus nasty and we're just interested in payoffs, then having, defining preferences over outcomes is going to be the same as defining preferences over strategies. Yeah. And as I said, we'll relax that a little bit when we look at, at what's called reciprocity, which is you know, punishing people who are mean. Okay, so the simplest solution concept, and one that I think is you know, a sort of baseline that is relatively conceptually satisfying, is this concept of dominant strategies and then based on that dominated strategies. Okay, so dominant strategy simply, uh, and it's easiest to think about this in a two-player setting, um, a strategy SI star, right, the star is there to say this is, this is a, an optimum, this is, a best, this is a best strategy, is dominant if it's the best response to any strategy others might play. So it dominates any strategy you might play, no matter what the other player does. Okay, and the way that's represented is the utility you're going to get from playing that dominant strategy against whatever the other person does is going to be bigger than the utility that you would get from playing any other strategy, right? So for any S minus I, no matter what the other person does, it's, this S star will be any other S minus, uh, SI prime, okay? So SI star, the dominant strategy, gives you more utility against any strategy that the other player might play than any other strategy you might play. And so that's, that's the case in the prisoner's dilemma, right? Whether the other person rats you out or not, it's always best in the prisoner's dilemma to rat them out. Okay, now, where there's a dominant strategy, a rational player will play it. What do I mean by a rational player? What I mean is somebody who actually is not actually trying to shoot themselves in the foot, right? Someone who's able to do some basic math and is not trying to shoot themselves in the foot. So here's an example of this, all right? Deciding whether or not to work on a group project. So let's have player one over here. And actually, let me just do that. So I don't lose. Here's player one, there's player two. Okay, so the way you can think about this game is this project that they're gonna do, either they both work, or work on it, but they, or they both don't, but they're both gonna get the same grade on it, right? Is one way you can think about it. And so um, the project is worth nine to each of them, if it gets completed. Right? If anybody works on it at all, it's worth nine, nine, nine utils to each player. Um, the cost of working on it is four for player one. And what did I say here is 10 for player two, except that uh, the cost, that's the cost if they work on it alone. And then the cost if they work on it together is two for player one and five for player two, right? So because if they work on it together, it's half the work for each of them. And if you take those numbers and figure out what the payoffs would be in each of those cells, you'll get that matrix of, of payoffs, okay? So that if player one works on it and player two doesn't, right? That's worth nine to player two because they just got a nice grade on the project without working on it. But it's only worth five to player one because they got nine points for the project, but they lost four because they had to do all the work. And so you can do the same kind of math and, get these, and fill in these, uh, these cells. And basically what's going on here is that player two has a dominant strategy, right? Whether player one works or not, right? If player one works, then player two is best response. Nine is greater than four, so do that. And if player one doesn't work, right? Zero is greater than negative one, so do, do that. So player two isn't gonna work no matter what, as long as, as long as they're rational and selfish. Rational and selfish. Okay, knowing this, so this is where beliefs come in. If, the, if player one believes that player two is rational and understands the payoffs of the game, then they're gonna know, oh yeah, 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 player two will not work no matter what. But check this out, if player two is not gonna work, it's still the case that five is greater than zero, so player one will work, okay? And, and so what we, what we get here, by the way, the fact that I have two little underlines there, one under the five and one under the nine, means that that strategy profile, player one works, player two doesn't work, is a mutual best response, right? And that's what we like. We like equilibrium is where nobody can do better from that point by deviating. It's a mutual best response. If player two doesn't work, it's best for one to play to work, and if player one works, it's best for player two not to. So it's a mutual best response. Um, and this is a situation where we don't actually, the, the assumptions necessary for, 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 to get here are not that overwhelming, right? We just had to believe that these folks knew each other's payoffs and their own payoffs and assumed that each other was smart enough to figure out a really sort of simple couple of rounds of strategic thinking and that they're selfish. So that they're selfish is actually the biggest, that's the worst assumption. That's going to turn out to be the, the, the really dumb-down assumption in this particular game. In this particular game, if players were actually totally selfish, um, which means to say not that they hate the other person, but that they're completely indifferent to the other person. Okay? If players are actually selfish, then the assumption that they know each other's outcomes and that they believe each other to be rational and that they do a couple of rounds of simple strategic thinking aren't such devastatingly dumb-down assumptions. Right? And so we think, I at least think that this solution concept is relatively um, appealing as a, an explanation for how things really work in the world. Now, let's take things a step further. We're, not, we're still nowhere near national equilibrium yet. Let's talk about a solution concept you may or may not have learned. I can't, it's in the neck of the textbook uh, that's used for 100A, uh, but I don't know if it's actually covered. I didn't cover it when I taught that class, and I don't know if other professors do. But basically, we can think about a strategy. We're still focusing on player I. A strategy SI prime is weakly dominated if there's some other strategy that player I could play, S double, SI double prime, that's at least as good as SI prime, no matter what the other player does, and actually beats SI prime for at least one of the things that the other player could do. Right, so if you don't know what the other player is going to do, and you're trying to decide between these two strategies, they, they render exactly, they might be exactly the same outcome for you for like nine out of ten of the things that your opponent might do, but there's just one case in ten where if your opponent does this, it's a better idea to do SI double prime. Okay? And so we would call that weakly dominated. Right? So if, if SI double prime is strictly